Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming in this afternoon for the presidential address. It's really a great honor to be here today as your president, and um, just really wonderful to see so many familiar faces out there, as well as some new faces. And uh, if you haven't noticed, there are ribbons on the name badges for, for new attendees and new members, and I just strongly encourage you all to reach out to someone you don't know, uh, either tonight at the poster session this evening, or the next poster session, or in any of the other sessions, because we are a, a really welcoming, friendly group, and uh, love to connect with new members. And new members, please feel free to approach members that, you, that may have a badge saying that they are uh, an ECPN member or a uh, conference planning member, board member. We'd really love to connect with you in the context of this conference. So I am really excited uh, to be here today. And I have two esteemed and influential presidential speakers here with me. And uh, we're going to have a conversation today about moving from large scale research to, to public health impact. Now, we'll introduce them in a moment. Uh, but before doing so, I just wanted to say a few words. You know, for those of you who've been coming to SPR for 5, 10, 20, or even tw all 27 years, as a few of you out there have been doing, uh, this format might look a little bit different than you're used to for the presidential ad address. Typically, the, the Wednesday presidential address is the president speaking about their goals and priorities uh, and, and thoughts about prevention science. Um, as they complete their term as president. And as I thought about what I wanted to do and have been thinking about this for the last two years, uh, I started to realize that what, what I really wanted to do was have a conversation and bring in stakeholders and really experts and people who are influential from both sides, from the research, the large scale research side and from the practitioner side. And that to move this dialogue forward, it would be perhaps more impactful to do that by having a conversation with leaders in this area than to hear me uh, speaking on this topic. So that is our, our plan today. And I know that, that that goal, that desire to move from research to practice and policy more rapidly uh, is shared by many, if not all of you in this room. It's one of SPR's strategic priorities. It's the uh, goal of the MAPS4 task force that is uh, presenting also at this conference. So. I believe this is a shared goal that many of us have, and I'm hoping that today will be one in many steps towards that, that direction. So I would say this is you know, something new. It's an, it's an experiment. Uh, it's, it, it's not a randomized trial, and you haven't consented to be here. <laughs> but uh, we'd like your feedback on it afterwards. So with that, I would first like to introduce the two presidential speakers. This is Matthew Gilman. He is with the National Institutes of Health at the Office of Director, and he directs the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes Program. And the second presidential speaker is Gail Taylor, and she, is with the, she has many affiliations, one of which is with the National Prevention Network, where she's the Vice President for External Affairs. And she's also Behavioral Health Wellness Director at the Department of Behavioral Health uh, and Development Services in Virginia. So I will, uh, we will turn to um, the, our conversation momentarily. But first, I just wanted to set the stage for this conversation. And you know, really, this is, a, in essence, a call to action to all of you, to all of us in this room, to sort of shorten this cycle or do a little bit better in the research practice policy program cycle. And I'm realizing now that the translation from Mac to PC is cutting off a few words, but there are only a few slides because this mostly will be a conversation. So why are we having this conversation? Well, there is really an urgent need out there uh, for a variety of reasons. One is that we still have a large number of public health crises. A very uh, well-known one right now is the opioid epidemic where we have uh, recent statistics from the CDC show that we have 130 deaths every day from opioid overuse, overdoses. So that is just one of many suicide. There are many other public health problems that are facing us as prevention scientists today. We also know that there are enormous health disparities uh, in outcomes such as obesity, heart disease, premature deaths, cr the correctional system, child welfare system involvement, uh, just to name a few, and we heard an outstanding plenary this morning about some of these topics and the interface with big data. 
We, <laughs> we have Siri speaking to us as part of our conversation, it sounds like. <laughs> Um, we also know, and this is some um, of the work by David Murray, who's here today as well from the Office of Disease Prevention, that has looked at NIH program funding and shown that less than 17% of programs are dedicated to prevention research. And if you sort of look at what, what those grants and, and, and programs are focusing on, less than 5% are focused on outcomes that are related to some of the most leading risk factors uh, for death. So, these are all significant problems. And then last, we know that there is a significant and uh, terrible lag between when we're doing our basic science research and making a difference in, in, in the field and actually implementing a program. And that is an older statistic of 17 years. And we did a lit review and tried to see if that has been shortened in recent decades or years and have not been able to see. If anyone knows of a, uh, that we've been able to improve upon that, I'd love to hear from you because that statistic, I believe, is 2002. So that's the problem, that's our urgent need, but we really are at a point where we have some great opportunities in a variety of ways. We know that there are effective programs, policies, and practices. Uh, you can go onto the Blueprints website, you can go on to the What Works Clearinghouse website of, of IES and find out about those programs. Um, and we know, for example, policies. Uh, Francis Collins, director of NIH, recently posted that easier access to naloxone will cuts the uh, rate of death for opioid overdose. So just having pharmacies be able to directly prescribe opioids to anyone will reduce uh, opioid deaths. So we know we have some leads in terms of programs and policies and practices. We also are in an era of big data, as is the theme for this conference. So we have uh, just a wealth of data from administrative data sources, uh, from wearables, from uh, genetic data, and we have tools, predictive analytics and machine learning tools. So with those tools, can we do better at shortening this cycle from research to, uh, to practice? And third, we're, you know, really as a field, thinking more about rigor and re reproducibility, replicating our studies, using larger samples, using data harmonization tools and, te and techniques, and also thinking more about science communication and how we, uh, how we communicate our science with stakeholders. And there's a session on uh, this topic on Friday at 8.30 around uh, sort of the, the rigor and re reproducibility of our science. And last, we have, we have a workforce, right? We have ECPN as part of SPR, and we also, the National Prevention Network reaches out to folks in all 50 states uh, and, and more. And so we have a ready workforce to be able to help solve this problem. So we are really well poised. And so what I'd like to do with that, with that stage set, is talk for a moment about what lies at this intersection of research and practice and policy. And so for that, I'm gonna to turn to our two guests today, Matt and Gail, and we will, this is again an experiment, so I have no idea how this will go, but we are gonna to try to have a conversation here <laughs> about this and mostly not use slides from the rest of this presentation on. Uh, however, before we get started, I just wanted to see so we have a sense of the audience. How many of you here have heard of the environmental influences on child health outcome, also known as ECHO situation? Okay, so that's maybe a quarter of you. And how many of you have heard, and, and I should have said before today, had you heard of it? <laughs> <laughs> and how many of you have heard of or know what the National Prevention Network does? Yeah. Oh, maybe about the same amount, probably a quarter. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty good. A quarter of each of you know a little bit about each of those. Uh, but what, I think what we're gonna do first is each uh, presidential speaker will spend maybe three to five minutes telling you about these initiatives before we have our conversation to make sure everyone has the same background information. So I'm going to turn it over first to Dr. Gilman. Thanks a lot, Leslie. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. The first thing I'll say is um, I'm really honored to be here. It's my first uh, time to the SPR meeting. And uh, uh, I've uh, gone to some stimulating sessions already, met a few of you, so thanks a lot for having me. Um, I have only a few slides to show, which is really unusual for me, um, but it'll get, get you a little uh, familiarized with what ECHO is. How many of you raised your hand for knowing both what ECHO and 
the national network are. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, great. Okay, so um, ECHO's mission is to enhance the health of children for generations to come. It is a nationwide research program, so here you can see the map of our grantees. Um, under the ECHO umbrella, we do observational studies. These are our cohort studies and interventions under the umbrella of the Idea State's Pediatric Clinical Trials Network. Um, there are 71 existing ongoing cohort studies of mothers and children. All of them are following the children. Some are still recruiting in pregnancy. Um, and the idea, one of our grand ideas, is to put them all together in something called the ECHO-wide cohort. The ECHO-wide cohort will consist of uh, approximately 50,000 kids and their families so that we can make it not only a nationwide research resource, but also perform solution-oriented uh, observational research, uh, research to inform practices, policies, and programs, and we'll talk more about that. On the clinical trial side, the Idea States Network uh, <clears throat> is a new network of uh, uh, states from the IDEA program. Those are states with historically low rates of NIH funding. And the goal is to allow rural or underserved children access to state-of-the-art trials in pediatrics. Um, overall scientific goal of, uh, of ECHO is to answer solution-oriented questions about the effects of a broad range of early environmental exposures on child health and development. And by a broad range of early exposures, we mean everything from society to biology. There's a lot of attention on the physical and chemical, but we also mean societal, medical, psychosocial, behavioral, and biological determinants. Uh, somewhat arbitrarily, the exposure period in ECHO, especially in the cohorts, is defined as conception to age five years. And we look at uh, four outcomes that are in the condition or disease category, so pre- and perinatal conditions, upper and lower airway, like asthma, obesity and its consequences, and the many facets of neurodevelopment. We've also added a fifth outcome we're calling positive child health, which is not the absence of disease, but it's about assets that enable ch uh, children's well-being. So I'm just going to stop there, and I hope that gives you just a little bit of background so that when the question and answer period comes, um, you have a context. Thanks. And I'll turn it over to Gail now. Good afternoon. Okay, that's weak. I'm from the South. I'm from Virginia. Good afternoon. Thank you. I know it's after lunch and it's late in the afternoon, but thank you all for coming to this session. We're really excited about this experiment. And first of all, I just want to clarify, I am not a researcher, okay? So I'll be giving you more of a People Magazine version of a journal as it relates to my language and conversation, okay? So I'm just going to go through a couple of slides to, to give you the context from where my remarks are coming from. Because I'm, a, once again, coming from a practitioner standpoint as well as a state-level policymaker and the, what we need as it relates to the work that you do. Historically, substance use disorder and substance when misuse prevention programs have been shaped around what we see up here. A lot of classroom programs, parenting classes, et cetera. All right? And one of the things that we relied on very heavily was NREP. Does anybody know what NREP is? Okay, a few of you. The National Registry for Effective Prevention Programs. We could just go on like we were ordering something from Amazon, find a program that fits what our target is, and we'd be done. All the research was there, all the outcomes were there, it made it easy, okay? Then we switched to this. Does anybody know what the strategic prevention framework is? Oh, not as many as I thought. Okay. SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, the federal agency, this is the framework that they use for all of their money as it relates to prevention now. It's called the Strategic Prevention Framework, commonly known as SPIF. So for the block grants, the substance abuse prevention and treatment block grant, the prevention side, we have to use this model. For all of the discretionary money that comes out, the Partnership for Success Strategic Prevention Framework, the STR, the State Targeted Response, the SOR, the State Opioid Response, all of those grants, we have to use this model. As a result, this model has changed the practice of prevention tremendously because it's more of a population health 
focus. And it changed the way we do prevention tremendously. The workforce had to gain a whole new skill set in order to do the work. In Virginia, a lot of people left the prevention workforce because they still wanted to be in the classroom doing programs and did not want to participate in this. And I'm sure you all can see it, it starts with assessment, which is why we need y'all. Okay, we need good data. Moving around to capacity planning, they learn how to do fantastic logic models, but then when we got to implementation, we got stuck or we get stuck because we're having a difficult time getting the research as it relates to the strategies around these areas. We focus more so, we still do the individually faced pro, um, focus programs with individuals and families, however, following the, what our funder has told us, we need to look more at population health. We need to look more at um, mobilizing and changing communities because as a result, if we have healthier communities, we'll have, ha we'll have healthier children, okay? So we had to change our focus to population health, doing environmental approaches and complementing those approaches with programs that are targeted at those at greatest risk. So those selected and indicated populations, all right? And we also started to look at community mobilization, environmental approaches as it relates to those key areas, access barriers, changing consequences, incentives, disincentives, physical design, modifying and changing policies. But with prevention also, we broaden what we do as it relates to substance use disorder in most of our state offices. We had to start looking at mental health um, promotion, suicide prevention, adverse childhood experiences, social determinants of health, but where can we go to get the research about around the strategies that are effective? We don't have NREP anymore. And I must say that even with NREP, it did not include a lot of environmental strategies. The workforce in Virginia, one of the things that they're it was a paradigm shift for them to shift to do environmental approaches, but then they were like, how do we evaluate them? And that's a constant question that we have at our NPN meetings, and I'll give a little bit more about NPN in a little bit. But that just gives you the context from a state policymaker as well as from the pr practitioner and where I'll be coming from as Leslie asks us some questions. So thank you. As, as Gail sits down, I just want to say that one of the ground rules we um, agreed upon ahead of, ahead of time was we're not gonna use acronyms. So. If we use acronyms that you don't understand, I think it'd be like a quarter in the jar for each of us or something like that. <laughs> and by the end of the afternoon, there'll probably be a big party, so. Yeah. So, uh, and I also just put up our next slide as well, because I wanted to remind everyone that this, at this part of the presidential address, it is we will be having, I'll be asking questions, we'll be having a dialogue, and then following this, we do have our full roundtable discussion just around the corner in Regency where we'd love to have you join us with your own questions and comments and thoughts about how to move the field forward in this way. So I'm going to start first with math, Matt, can, are the mic, can you all hear us okay in the back? Okay. Just pick up the whole microphone <laughs> in its stand. Um, so, Matt, when you were, I don't know if you all caught this, but he said there are 50,000 children in the, the ECHO cohort, uh, study uh, and that there were about 75 different cohorts that made up that 50,000. And one of the things I was particularly interested in was what you talked about this fifth outcome of positive health. And as a prevention scientist, one of the things this group is really interested in is strengths-based approaches and finding risk and protective factors uh, related to, to really ultimately help positive outcomes. And so I was wondering if you could say a little bit about, you know, it's not as common to have a focus on positive outcomes. Could you talk more about that? Yeah, we're really, whoa, we're really excited in ECHO to have positive health as one of our outcomes. As I said, it's not the absence of disease, but it's about the assets that enable well-being. So things like meaning and purpose and life satisfaction and achievement and sleep. Um, and the reason that we are really excited about this outcome is that number one, it's very child-centric. So yes, we're interested in the life course, we're interested in the whole life course and what determines, what early life factors determine 
disease over the life course, but we're also interested in how kids are doing. And how kids are doing is about their own well-being. So it's a very child-centric outcome. The second thing is that it cuts across disease silos. So it's not about this disease or that disease. It's really about um, what the holistic view of a child. And the third thing I would say is that <clears throat> most of uh, outcomes we measure, um, even when we're talking about things like ideal cardiovascular health or ideal lung health, we're talking about the absence of risk factors. So, you know, if you look at body mass index, for example, we define overweight as over the 85th percentile for age and sex. Everything under this 85th is, is normal, except for under the fifth. So we don't usually look at, you know, the 75th, the 50th, the 25th. We're not looking at that side of the equation. So it's really important, I think, for us to look at the positive side of these things that are health indicators. And as Leslie said, that also enables us to look earlier on at both risk and resilience factors that give rise to an outcome like this. So thanks for the question. Thank you. And I'm going to turn to Gail for a moment, too, just kind of keeping on this positive outcomes or what kind of what works or what theme. Um, speaking in your role as someone who's overseen programs and practices in an entire state and, and also in counties and has also national uh, impact, are there certain, you know, you talked about the framework, are there certain kind of services, programs, practices that you feel are particularly promising or are working uh, to target some of these problematic outcomes and really promote positive health? Mm -hmm. One of the things, whoop, can you hear me? One of the things that we did, we look at um, our office once was called the Office of Prevention Services. So we prevented substance use disorder or substance abuse. We changed the name of our office to the Office of Behavioral Health Wellness. And that is because, once again, we look at reducing, su preventing suicide, substance use disorder, and promoting mental health. It was less stigmatizing as we would go out and talk if we talked about wellness. Everybody was able to accept and understand wellness. So we changed our name in order to provide greater um, comfort in accessing other, other aspects of the work that we do. But in addition to that, some of the things that we have done that have been extremely helpful is the fact that we, changed, we had to change the skill set as it relates to our prevention workforce. They, as it re relates to the SPIF model, they had to learn the core competencies around each one of those elements. So each one had to use, learn how to do a needs assessment, how to use data in terms of a new data system, logic models, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So everything around that. As a result of that, they gained more credibility in their workforces, which was wonderful because the majority of them are in treatment facilities that address disease. Additionally, with that, we require that they have to partner with their local community coalitions because our philosophy is substance use disorder, mental illness is a community problem that requires, is a community issue that requires a community response. So as a result of them working and partnering in their communities, it heightened the opportunity for them to gain greater visibility of their work, to establish relationships, to gain key stakeholders. In one of our programs, the Partnership for Success, they increased their st stakeholder participation by 45% in two years, which is amazing as it relates to engaging the community in the issues of substance use disorder, opioids, um, suicide, et cetera. So those are some of just a few things okay, that we've been that doing. Really interesting. Thank you, Gail. Um, I, now just thinking, I want to turn back to Matt for a moment. and. When you first talked about ECHO, it was the observational research, but in fact, there is this Idea States Pediatric Clinical Trial Network piece of it too, which does interface with stakeholders and with the practitioners. Could you talk, tell us a little bit more about that? <clears throat> yeah, the Idea States Pediatric Clinical Trials Network is really a novel kind of network because, uh, research network, because it's not based on a particular population, it's not based on a particular condition, it's not based on a particular set of clinicians. Um, what it's really based on is this idea of 
uh, <clears throat> fostering rural or underserved kids to participate in state-of-the-art clinical trials, which they really have been not represented in. Um, so in the Idea States Network, it's somewhat easier, perhaps, to see the translation between the research and practice or programs. And in fact, our portfolio, so even in the first three years of the Idea States Network, includes everything from pharmacokinetic trials, so, so that's really down deep into the physiology, um, all the way to practice change trials, cluster randomized control trials of practice change. And that's actually one of our um, opioid trials that's probably coming to the fore will be that. We have a focus on neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. Um, <clears throat> it's a way for, um, you know, we also have a stakeholder engagement uh, working group that is engaging not only with potential participants and families, but also with communities. And these communities include um, not only the, the target, what I said about rural, but also particular groups like American Indian tribes and tribal nations. Um, so uh, we, enc we encourage many of the same principles that you're talking about. Um, so so we're, uh, from a standing start, the network has really made a lot of progress in the, in the first uh, couple, three years. And we're starting to see some, uh, some products out of the network. Um, should I segue into solution-oriented research? I was just, just going to follow up. Yeah. This sounds like you used the term solution-oriented research in your yeah. opening remarks. And what this sounds like yeah. part of that. Because yeah. then I'll respond to yeah, you say it in a minute. Okay. Right, because I'm sort of responding to what you're talking about. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> it's harder sometimes to see how observational research, cohort studies, can translate into programs, policies, and practices. So we have a dedicated strategic um, planning process to see if we can identify a few of those observational analyses every year that will really do that. So we've created a strategic planning task force. We've created criteria for what we call big wins. And the first two of those criteria are, what is the actual clinical trial or other program or policy that your observational study is going to inform? And what is, what is the priority of the end user stakeholder, that's the term we're using, that you're filling? So we want to go to networks like Gales. We want to go to things that NIH has produced, that the US Preventive Services Task Force has produced, that <clears throat> professional societies uh, name as, their, as they, um, their research priorities that will move the needle. And we want to ally our observational research with those questions. So it's something new for, uh, for cohort researchers to do that. And we're sort of moving that ship in that direction and really excited about those things. So um, I'm hoping that this allows much more interaction with the kinds of organizations that, uh, that Gail represents. Because as Matt talked about, the strategic planning task force task forces, we call those our community coalitions that are key stakeholders that represent the communities that they serve. Once they started doing needs assessments, their practices changed tremendously. To give you a concrete example, Piedmont, they used to do a lot of education, all right, but then they really could not tell us the impact of what all of this education was, was. And they said that the reason they did it is because the communities love it. And so why do they love it? What are they seeing? What are you seeing change? And they couldn't answer. So after a lot of changing and capacity building and us not approving their funding for certain things, they had to change. And so their community coalitions did an assessment. They did some focus groups. And one of the things as it relates to the opioid crisis, it's a really concrete example of how they impacted their community. They did focus groups and found out that the veterinarian, that people were getting dogs from the dog pound, all right, injuring them, taking them to the veterinarian so that they could get opioids prescribed because dogs can be prescribed opioids. So then they were diverting those opioids for use. Come to find out, in doing some more exploration, they looked at the PDMP, which is the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. I did clarify that. <laughs> the where you know all of the prescribers have to put in their data when they pr do prescriptions. Veterinarians were, are not were in Virginia were not a part of the PDMP. 
So that coalition joined another coalition in an adjoining county, went to the common legislator of those two counties and said, we need the, P the veterinarians to be putting their information into the PDMP. Guess what? The legislator took it to our General Assembly through the, gen through the legislative process. It is now in law that veterinarians have to participate in the PDMP. <laughs> going, <laughs> going back to, so they can give you definite outcomes in terms of what happened as a result of them changing their focus, looking at their data, seeing where the gaps were in their practice, and coming up with a policy, going to a legislator, which takes a special skill set, believe me, mm -hmm. I'm in Virginia. So as a result, for them to be able to get that, poly that law passed, it was amazing. So that's just a concrete example of the power position, pre prevention, um, using your data, planning, et cetera. And just one follow-up on that. that. You were not talking about NPN and all that, right? No. You were talking, okay. So how does then NPN enter this platform too? That's in all 50 states. How does that play a role? How do researchers connect with their practitioners mm -hmm. in their states? How many of you know who your NPN is? Raise your hand. Wow. Okay. The, every state and territory has an NPN. That's someone in the same role that I am. National Prevention Network. National Prevention Network. Click. Click. <laughs> so, National Prevention Network. We are the identified leaders in our states as it relates to substance use disorder prevention. We're the ones that manage the substance abuse prevention set aside from the block grant. We're the ones that are also responsible for all of the federal money that comes down the pike from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. We manage all those resources. It's our responsible, responsibility to get those resources out into the community to all of the practitioners that implement programs, practices, and strategies. It is our responsibility to make sure that when we respond to the block grant, we let them know what evidence-based process that we use to identify their strategies. Lately, without NREP, that, one, that question is difficult to answer, which is why it's so important for you to get to know your NPN in your state so that you can assist in identifying those evidence-based practices, programs, and strategies. One of the things that many of the states have done is to um, convene an evidence-based work group. How many of you are in your state's evidence-based work group? Oh, opportunities are here. Our evidence-based work group is comprised of someone from Virginia's Tech that's in population health, coalitions, some providers, uh, some evaluators, and a few other stakeholders. When the opioid epidemic and the money started coming down the pike, we realized we needed their help for them to help identify what are the evidence-based programs practiced in a practices and strategies that we need to fund to address this issue. They went out, took a couple, several months in order to do some research, and guess what? They came back with little or nothing because they said the opioid epidemic was so, came on us so quickly that there were very few evidence-based strategies identified. So what they decided was that we would look at several issues, and I won't go into the details, but if certain things work for alcohol and tobacco, possibly they'll work for opioids. The biggest one is having access. So it's important to once again get to know your MPN because we need you to help us identify what is the research telling us or we need the research done. So. Let me just respond to some things that we found about uh, op opioids, especially in the, the part of that that we're interested in ECHO, which is sort of the maternal child intergenerational transmission, where to interrupt that with a particular focus on NOWS, which is neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. Um, so these are pilot data not published yet that I'm going to tell you about, but in our network, in our, in our trial network, the, the first thing we did was actually um, an observational study. It was to survey 30 sites to see what the variation in care is across those sites. And lo and behold, if you look across those sites, 
the, the variation in use of medication-assisted treatment in pregnancy goes from about 5% to 80%. And the variation in use of uh, opioid pharmaceuticals for, the, uh, for opioid withdrawal syndrome in neonates goes from about 5% to, 5 to 80%. So when the variation is so great, you know that not everyone's doing the right thing and there's a great need to identify the best practices. So here we are on one side needing best practices. On the other side, the research is actually in a place where it needs to test practices to find out what they are. So that's the bridge. Mm -hmm. Very, really interesting. And I just wanna follow up on that a little bit and turn it to health disparities and just thinking about it. I know both of your programs uh, are am interested in reducing health disparities. How? What are you doing in that regard, and how can are there things that you could get from each other, researchers from the st stakeholder practitioner side or practitioners from the research side that would help initiatives in that regard? Behavioral health equity is another area that's um, under my office, and I have a full-time behavioral health equity consultant, and her thing to me on a weekly basis is, Gail, data. We need data. Data, data, data. Where do I get the data? I can't do it all by myself. I need data. I need some help. So that is one of the areas that we struggle with in identifying the disparate populations. Another area under me is the mental health and refugee and immigrants. And so that is a population as it relates to disparities, we're working really hard to engage the communities. And it's almost like, I don't want to say it's, um, it's easy because we have one, another person that has already identified the populations, but it's a population that we have not identified. Some of them that we're just making assumptions on, the LGBTQ population community, we don't have any data, but we know the research, we do know this part of research, they're at highest rate risk for tobacco use, alcohol, Etc. and in our state, suicide. So we do have limited data, but we really want to be able to infuse the SPF model more in the disparate populations than we are now, but we need that data. So I'd like to address this both on our intervention side and the observational side. So as I've said before, the, um, the purpose of the Idea States Network is actually to include rural and underserved children. Well, that doesn't uh, well, it, 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 what it does is uh, it, it takes account of known disparities, rural-urban disparities in many of our outcomes, and tries to ameliorate it on the rural and underserved side. It doesn't actually address the disparities directly by comparing with more advantaged populations, but what it does is takes underserved populations and tries to give them better access to, uh, to research that will improve their lives. On our cohort side, we already know through some collective analyses that we've done that we have a wide variety of geography, of race, ethnicity, of socioeconomic status. Um, I'll give you an example of, um, again, a preliminary uh, look at some data on the incidence of asthma. Um, so uh, this was done among 25,000 uh, of our um, mother-child pairs um, in a and what we call a collective analysis it was sending programs to the data before the data are on the platform. And we saw two things that stood out. One is that the, the cumulative incidence, that means have you ever had asthma, up till age 20 is a lot higher than we thought it was because the incidence of asthma uh, doesn't abate that much during teenage years. But we also saw that the black-white differences in, in, in the incidence of asthma occur up to the age of eight, but don't occur afterwards which was a surprise. And so it may tell us something about the early origins rather than the later, later in childhood origins of the incidence of asthma and how they might explain disparities between blacks and whites in asthma incidents. So that's, that's one example of how we can use observational data to start to look at disparities. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would say is that uh, it looks as though um, only half of our participants are gonna be uh, non-Hispanic white we probably have, overall in this 50,000, we're probably gonna have about a quarter Hispanic and um, uh, probably one-sixth to uh, one-fifth uh, uh, non-Hispanic black. 
Um, we're very interested, too, in incorporating American Indian Alaska Natives. On the network side, um, Alaska is one of our sites, and it represents 273 tribes uh, in the Alaskan Tribal Health Consortium. Um, and on the cohort side, we're really happy that after two years of negotiation, um, the Navajo Nation uh, signed a data sharing and use agreement uh, with our data analysis center just earlier this month that allows the Navajo birth cohort study to share its data with the rest of the cohorts. The Navajo birth cohort study aims are to look at um, uranium and other metals that pregnant women or infant are exposed to from the, the tailings that mine operators left behind even though they said they would clean them up and what the effects are on neurodevelopment. So we're really happy to have that, uh, that uh, negotiation done and be able to incorporate uh, that tribal nation's data in our platform. And that's a clear example of why we need more mats out there to translate the data because it'll inform our practice. So thank you for thank your you. comments. And this time went super fast. We are essentially out of time, but I just want to ask one last follow-up, which, uh, Gail, you talked about, you kind of put a call out there for everyone here to connect with your NPN, connect with your state to have an influence mm -hmm. connecting research to practice. Matt, are there, ECHO is a, it's an NIH grant, people already have the grants. How can this group, or is there a way in the future for folks here to be part of that initiative? Well, we're really interested um, in two things. One is, as you represent your various societies, including SPR, but the other ones you're involved with, we just heard from mm -hmm. Gail, um, what the priorities are for translating research into action. So um, you say, okay, this is a priority. This is the evidence we need. We'll try to get the evidence. So that's one way to engage. But if you're a researcher and want to engage in the ECHO-wide cohort, um, the existing data from these cohorts, which go back in some cases five years, in some cases 10 years, in some cases 20 years, would be on the platform in less than a year, um, uh, fully on the platform in less than a year. The best way right now to engage in that process is to ally yourself with an ECHO investigator. Um, in the future, the data will be available uh, through protected means and also through an anonymized public data set to researchers who are not affiliated with ECHO. Great. And there well, are lots of ECHO investigators, so. Yeah, I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we'd, wel we'd welcome collaboration. So I want to th give thank you very much, Gail and Matt. I did not get to all my questions, and I hope that you all have some questions and comments and thoughts to continue this discussion. For those of you who aren't in other sessions, if you want like to join us in 10 or 15 minutes, around the corner. But thank you, Matt and Gail. Mm -hmm.